Welcome everyone to our uh, another one of our Learn Fast video webinars. We've uh, we've been doing these for a while since the pandemic started. This is our our fourth year of doing these. We've done 160. This is 100 number 163. So we've done quite a few. Uh, we have as a co-host today Matt Romanowski. I think Matt has been our number one. Uh, co-host as in as at least as in numbers of times he's joined us the uh, uh the uh, and i looked back as i was uh, getting ready for this webinar and uh it was almost exactly a year ago the last time matt joined us so there was uh i think he co-hosted uh, with with tice one one time but um the last one that he did by himself was about a year ago. So it's been a while. Um, I don't think Matt's been doing anything out there. So, you know, we have to have him come in and do something now. Um, so Matt's going to join us here today. And what we're going to talk about is, is all systems go uh, properly preparing for a big event. There is a, we, I get a lot of comments and questions and, and we chat with people. And uh, one of the things that, um, uh, it has not been laid out real well for some folks is maybe what what should you do as you're as you're uh, you're in the you're in your race shop you're in your garage you're out in your driveway however however it is you prep your stuff to get to ready to go to a to, to a big event or any event what what are some things some things you should do as far as the aim system uh, and to get ready to make the make the event just a whole lot more calm and relaxing for you. There's, it's a stressful environment and it sure would be nice if when you get there, everything is just prepared. You turn on your, your AIM data logger and uh, it recognizes the track. It's all prepared. It's all cleaned off. It's all, everything is ready to go. And we're, so we're going to talk about that today to take one of those, uh, some of those things that may, 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 bother you and make make life a little bit more stressful in a stressful event we're going to try to help you understand how to maybe do some things to keep that from happening so so what i'd like to do first is 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 introduce matt and chat a little bit about uh matt matt's background real quickly he's been, like i say he's been on here quite a bit so there's not a whole lot to introduce but but matt is an aim dealer and he's uh up there from the new hampshire area up in the opposite corner of this country that i am from and uh Matt's been an AIM dealer for quite a while. One of the things he does is uh, he's out at the track quite a bit on the phone, even more than that, chatting with people and helping people do things. And of course, many time AIM co-host. Thanks, Matt, for joining us. I sure appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me. I can't believe it's been a year. It, uh, I was surprised I myself. That. I was surprised myself that you hadn't done one for a while. I, yeah, I, I thought maybe you were just being lazy or ran away from us, or, but you know, but uh, no, I joke. <laughs> the um, it has been a while, but um, <clears throat> now that we're doing them once a month, it, it rolls past, and we've had a lot of ones we've wanted to do with uh, some software updates and things like that. So, so what we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about getting ready. Uh, for for uh, for an event with with your aim products uh, not just the software but the hardware the firmware and it, and even some processes and and matt's going to kind of lead the lead the discussion and um and we're, uh, we have some links that uh, will will be into the webinar chat for those of you that are here live and uh if you're watching this on youtube later if you just go down to the to the, the video description box, all of the links that we're going to talk about today will be will be down there as well. So if uh, if I mention a link, just uh, scroll down and look in the video description. You'll find all the links there as well. So uh, this particular presentation has been created into a, a PDF file, and uh, you'll be able to to, to watch that later and, and print it out if you wish for for some ideas. So Matt, let's talk about getting ready and, uh, and getting. Uh, I see that you've broke it down into even some sub subtopics of getting ready. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Take a take a few minutes and um, uh, talk through what what getting ready means to you. Yeah. So as I thought about it, there's so many times I show up at the track and the first thing somebody comes over to me and goes, hey, do you have a cable? So as I approach this to kind of get ready for a big race weekend or really kind of any race weekend, the first thing that came to my mind was, do you have the download cables you need? So if you're dealing with an MXL Pista, you need the three and a half millimeter microphone jack, or if you have the, there's one that's even a little more special. Um, the standard for a long time has been the USB mini cable that'll work on uh, all your Smarty Cams, your Smarty Cam HDs, and the USB connector for all the Dash products. Um, and then if you have a Smarty Cam 3, those now incorporate the USB-C 
cable. So you're going to need one of those. And then I actually thought and forgot in here, if you have an Evo 4S or one of the PDMs or some of the, even the older, I think it was like the XG logs, there's a different cable for those. Um, so I always double check. For me, what I do is I have my backpack every time I go to the track. I keep all those cables in there and I actually carry spares. Um, so that way, when you come running up to me and you need one, I can loan you one and give it to you. Years uh, ago, I uh, uh, I was on the road traveling a lot, going to events to help people. And I had, um, I had, I think it was Robbie that did it for me. I asked our technical guys, could you build me a cable with a USB on one end and then the old octopus of of cables on the other end, right? And, yeah. darned, and darned if they weren't able to build me the two different MX, older MXL ones, an Evo 4 uh, and a USB uh, mini at, at the time was our, our main ones, right? They were able to build me that. I had one to plug into my computer and then just plug one of the other four or five uh, into a name device. That was, a, that was pretty special. It was very one-off, but it, it worked really well for me for a long time. That's pretty trick. Yeah, um, exactly. Because not having the cable is the first thing that you see <laughs> all the time. And you even get it from people that are experienced and maybe it got left in the hotel room or something happened, they grabbed a different bag. So I always tell people, make sure you carry the cable that you need. Just make sure it's there. Um, with video being so important, make sure you have the right memory cards. So I tell everybody, when you get a Smarty Cam, go on Amazon, buy a couple extra cards. So that when you take one card out, you always have another one to put in right away, because that's the most probably common reason people don't end up with good video. The next part is if you have a camera like the Smarty Cam 3 Sport and it takes a micro SD, make sure you have that micro SD. If you have a ca camera that takes the full SD, like a Smarty Cam HD, the Corsas, the GPs, the Dual, make sure you have a real um SD card in there. Don't use the adapter. Um, even when somebody says they have a really good adapter, they cause problems all the time. So, yeah. and even worse, sometimes they work for a while and then all of a sudden they just stop. And, yeah. uh, but they always will stop or miss frames at some point. It is not, uh, uh it is not recommended at all. You just get rid of them, get be done with it. And then uh, uh, Bruce just asked a question that was actually on top of my mind as uh, as we were kind of finishing out the memory card side. Th there's a lot of people that ask, you know, what is the best SD card memory size? And um, uh, gosh, it's it's one of those things where you could go and get the 128 gigabyte card, right? And and you've got the magic card. You spent some pretty good dough for it. And you uh, and you put it in there, and you can run that card all weekend, and not have to you know, take the, the videos off of it. But boy, what I have found by far, without any question in my mind, the best way to do it is get maybe a three or four 16 gigabyte cards, and then you have number one some backups, and then number two. I am terrible about when I go to the car, I pull out the memory card, I download the data, I go off to the, you know, set my computer down and, and to take the video off and put onto the computer, look at it, I forget to put the card back in. So by having multiple smaller cards, I put one in my pocket or in my mouth, I take one out, I put it in, in, in my hand, stick the other one in, close the smarty cam and I walk away. The car is now prepared and ready for the, the next event. So I, I always suggest maybe a little bit smaller, 16 gigabytes will handle most of a day, even if you never download it and uh, or all of a day, even if you don't download it and they're a ton cheaper and you can have backups at that point. What do you think about that? I, I do the same exact thing. The only difference, I always got 16s and the last time I bought them, I was finding 32s and 64s were more the sweet spot of pricing. Yeah. So I've always done it kind of like, where's the good deal on a multi-pack of high quality class 10 cards? Yeah, um, highest, highest speed ones you can get, certainly. Yep. Yeah. So I found it's in that 16 to 32 range. And um, a good question here from Bjorn about yeah. being able to delete cards or having to format them. I typically just go in and delete off the videos. Um, in my way of sort of redundancy is I always copy everything to the computer and I have the card. I The codec and the way the cameras work is so efficient. The video files are big, but they're not giant. I usually leave them on um, the video card until after the event and I've copied everything over just as an extra 
be all safe. Yep. Um, it, losing it, video is like one of my phobias when I'm at the track. So you'll see me all the time. I'm like going back to the car, making sure there's a card in there, yeah. even though I've done it three times. Um, exactly. It's just Car one of the ones that I was worried Car about. Cards is just one of those subjects that you get get good cards, get good name brand cards. There's a lot mm -hmm. of uh, false ones out there, a lot of uh, ones that may even be marked regular. If you find something on on, on some site that uh, is ridiculously underpriced and yet it's a brand name, it's probably not a, a, a real card, right? And uh, so be, be careful, buy, buy something from a reputable company with a good name at high speed, class 10, you're gonna be okay for a long time. Yep. Um, and then the other one that I thought is chargers is um, Raj and I were talking just a few minutes ago about solos and solo twos, um, smarty cams, make sure you carry that charger in case you need it. If you're using just a plain solo and you don't have it hooked up to your car, you're going to need to charge it up. Um, there's nothing worse than getting on the track and not having that charger with you. And then finally, remember your computer, right? It's easy in the hustle and bustle of trying to get everything ready and pack the trailer and get the car, make, you know, if you're flying in so you know, like you're always running the late. So just make sure you have that too. Um, and then with race studio three one one thing i'd like to add it, it has helped me a bunch and, and i don't know if you, you you do anything like that but every once in a while you'll get i'll i'll walk upon a a team that has a, a camera that's dead the cable had been disconnected or something the camera is really dead and they want it needs a charge right before before you can go out it's always good to have it fully charged i wander around with 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 one of these uh, micro start boxes with with yep. usb ports and what's so cool about it you can take the cable just set it in the car and let it charge up the camera without taking the camera out taking it away from its you know you had it perfectly pointed and and, and all of that boy these are pretty handy at the track if you don't want to run a cable in you know the you know, long cable in from power so th these things have been pretty handy for me yes those are super handy and i actually i have one in all of my cars <laughs> it's in the tow truck cars and my wife's cars and there in you the go. Porsche. like there they're go. everywhere so i always have one around um, okay sorry to interrupt you were j jumping into race studio three and and starting the process okay what do we do to make sure we're ready for that yeah so i'm one that before i leave for the track when i have time i always go through i make sure my software is updated we're going to show you a screenshot of that make sure the tracks are all downloaded updated because um, it's easy as a user to forget how much extra information is in that uh, track database and in those track files. So we really need to download those and make sure they're up to date. It's one of the most common ones I see when I get to the track and I help someone is there's marks that says that that track file is out of date. Um, and then another good one as you're trying to do things, and I ran into it with someone just this morning, is no kind of the setup the downloading path and the file naming convention that you have in Race Studio 3. Because I asked someone this morning, said, hey, can you shoot me a data file? And then it was, well, how do I export it? Where is it? Um, all really great questions. And one that when you're pressed for time at the track and in that high stress environment, it's kind of good to know that before you get there and not have to be on the spot, you know, trying to figure that one out. And I'm going to, I'm going to just get a bring to the front Ray Studio 3. And if you go to the um, if you go to the download tab while you're connected or you can go to the to the um, to the download button here if you do not have your gauge connected and and it will bring up this dialog box which will give you the ability to okay where do I want my data to go and you can change it. And I I I check this before I go to the event every time I try to always store my data in a in in one single folder. I always just follow aim sport then data. And then folders below that I create a folder by date every time on um, by when I'm at the track. It looks at what date is it. If there isn't a folder for that, it creates one. And then I've that you can also set up your file naming structure very easily right here. Uh, I always like to have the date and time in my file and you varies for different people for different things, but maybe it's racer and then track, you know, what, whatever's important to you to have as part of the file name. This is very, very handy to have set up ahead of time and make sure that you're ready to go. It is, it's, it's one that, um, it's great to kind of know where it is. And then also one of the ones I noticed is you have the racer name in the file. I do the same thing. So then if you're working with a whole bunch of people, it's really nice to just be able to go like, oh, here's Matt's data and send it off. Here's Roger's data and share it with them. Yeah, visually um, you can see it. Yep. Yeah. 
So um, great way to, to kind of know where everything is. And then the next part is after we have our stuff, we have Re Studio 3 ready, is what do we need to do to the car? Um, and this is something I do every time I show up, because a lot of times I'll fly in and then I'm on the cars. Um, so I haven't been able to do it before I left. So I always get to the car. I check that I have the proper track loaded. Um, with Trans Am, we were just at St. Louis Worldwide Technology Raceway in St. Louis. Um, and it was a track Trans Am hasn't been there in 35 years. It was my first visit there. So it was one. None of the cars had that. So I actually went around to our team and then helped a bunch of the other teams that we work with and loaded up for them. Because when I asked them, I said, hey, do you guys load the track? You just get a blank stare back because it's in the realm of all the things they have to do. Sometimes the dash is the last one they think about. Yeah. Um, I also always go in and I turn the gauge on, turn the dash on, and then I make sure the GPS starts up okay gets a good satellite count accuracy and it finds the track because sometimes as if the we run with Mike Cope racing, the cars start out in Florida, they go to St. Louis. Sometimes it takes the GPS a couple minutes to get the lock, to get everything going. Um, or for the instance, this one, we were under this metal roof structure kind of in a garage and that makes it take even longer because it can't get it. So sometimes you have to push the car out, um, and do those those things to make sure that you get it and it's all ready. Because if you were one that you pushed the car to the trailer, jumped in, turned it on, went driving, you might have a GPS problem because you didn't give it a chance to boot up and get all those satellites. That um, problem will self fix itself, but it, your first half of your first session is just going to be really junk data, if not no data at all. So yeah, and and for the only reason that you didn't start it out to make sure everything was working before. Um, so. Uh, Really simple thing to do. Just fire up the dash, let it get it in. You'll look at the info line on the bottom. It says GPS good. It knows where you are. You're ready to go. Um, the other one to go through is make sure your sensors are reading right. If you have a throttle position of steering, um, any other sensors, make sure they're all reading right. And then also kind of a general sensor check. If you have an ECU, turn it on. Make sure that you're getting all the data, that nothing got mixed up. Um, I would be a liar if I didn't say it happened to me. I was under the dash working on things. By accident, I hit a can line. I had no data for my car. Um, only because I bumped a line, pulled the, conne the connector apart, and didn't work. It, it would have been easier to catch that when I unloaded the car than it would be you know, after you get on the track and you don't have that data. So it's a good chance just to check it out. Um, We'll talk about this and I'll show you a slide is make sure you kind of have the display pages you want and everything. And then one of the really cool features that we have now is those predictive reference laps. So like Ed, who's made some comments and everything, he's at the runoffs now. So if they have a good lap and they have that as the reference, make sure you load that in the dash so you can use it while you're driving. Um, that's a super powerful tool. You just have to remember to load it in there um, and a great thing to use if you're there. And on the rest of this, so, all, all of the topics that, that Matt has listed here, he, he mentioned GPS and doing that at the track. All the rest of these can be done in the garage before you uh, be, before you leave, right? So there's uh, the only one that uh, – and you might even do the GPS one at home before you go just to make sure everything is working. But the GPS one needs to be done at the track as well. But all the rest of these are, are, are pre, pre-travel things that you can do to get ready. Yeah. Um, okay. Get ready for the next one? Yes. Okay. So when we want to go and um, update Re Studio 3, when we open up our software, we're going to see the cloud icon up in the top right, right here. And that gives us um, a little down arrow that I kind of highlighted. And then you know there's an update. You can click on that button. You can then um, see what's available and whether it's firmwares, which you need, and I always tell people, even if you only have an MXL2, download all the firmwares. It's easier to let Race Studio 3 manage that whole package so you always have what you need than it is to try to, to go through. The other part for me, if you only download maybe the one gauge or the one dash you have, you're always going to have this arrow. You'll never know that there was something new unless you um, kind of have the presence to always go in, check, look to see if there's new one for your one. So to me, it's not worth it. Download all of them. 
and and by default they're they're really pretty the, the firmwares especially are pretty small files and yes ray studio 3 only keeps the the last three so you're not yep. you're slowly creating a bunch of junk on your hard drive it throws away the the older ones uh, automatically so yep and then the other one is over here on the left is you have this track symbol and you'll see the same thing there'll be an arrow right there where you can get a notice you click the button it automatically downloads those tracks it updates the database and then you are ready to go and you have all the proper tracks in race studio 3 so you're up to date you have the right firmwares um you're good to set the car to bring the computer to the car and do everything and this one's more important than I think a lot of people think. They, they have that little red dot that sits there by the track map, and they don't necessarily do those too much. Please yep. up, update your track database. It's just simple, you know, uh, 30 seconds to do it. I probably have been pushing Emiliano harder than I probably ought to, to, uh, to update tracks to, to the latest and greatest, best GPS information we can find from cars with 25 hertz GPS 09 sensors. And when we create those better base maps for, for, for the track maps in, in this area, you end up getting some better um, analysis because it's compar doing some comparison things against those, those reference laps. So make sure that you uh, update your track maps. It's an important thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to the next page. Now, after you have those the proper tracks loaded, here's sort of the next one is if you were at a, if it's a big event, and you really want to be double, triple, quadruple careful, um, load only the one track that you're going to run. If you're at a track, like we're talking kind of a lot of people here on the, the webinar today or at um, VIR for the runoffs, VIR I think has nine configurations, Roger, something yeah, like a, that. It's a bunch. Um, if there's that many, take them all off, load just the one you're running. Save yourself any confusion, any extra intervention that you have to do. Just put the one you're running. Um, and what that means is if you're using an RS2 system, a MXL Pista, Smarty Cam with it, um, you have to load the track in the dash and in the camera. And that's going to give you all your lap times. It's going to give you your overlay on the camera and do everything. Um, if you have a Race Studio 3 system, uh, MXL2 and MXS and MXP and MXG, uh, Evo 4S, load it in the camera and the dash still. If you're using um, a new Smarty Cam 3 along with an MXP or an MXS uh, Ray Studio 3 system, you only have to load the track into the dash. It's a great um, kind of update to the systems and it makes it a lot easier that you're not trying to manage it in two spots. You're not forgetting to delete it in one or take it out if you have different versions um, so you can put it in the one, but make sure you have it right. I was recently at Watkins Glen. That's another one that gets people because they'll pick kind of all the tracks in America and they load the long course and the short course, and then they get the wrong overlay or something happens. Um, and we, and we even do, we, we maybe make that even worse, uh, as a company, as a, as a benefit to everybody, we ship these loggers with the main tracks you know nationwide uh already in there and, and every once in a while you'll have a, a, a watkins Glen or a new jersey chloe mentions new jersey they have two tracks on the same property but they're close yep. enough that it uh it takes the logger a few laps to figure out okay yeah this is where i'm at right so it is just a to me it just takes just 30 seconds you just delete all drag the one track onto your uh, logger that you're going to run that uh, that weekend and it uh, you have just resolved uh, some of these problems that occasionally happen. So, and um, it there's so many tracks that it happens at that there's so many versions because you know as Roger's talking, I was thinking about Pocono has I think oh, 11 yeah. configurations or something like they're all over. So it's a really easy way just to make sure things are right, um, and well, make sure you have that one loaded where you want it. There is nothing. Those of those of you in the in the West Coast, there is nothing like Button Willow, though. 
uh, Button Willow, uh, 97 configurations at Button Willow, <laughs> right? So uh, there is nothing like Button Willow, but th th that whole piece is uh, is makes it very easy. And if I'm gonna, I'm just gonna bring it up here real quickly uh, while Matt gets ready to to do the uh, to the next topic. But if we go to the tracks, I, I, I'm connected right now to the to this MXM over here. Over here, and if I want to add a track, I've got these four tracks that are on here. Let's say we're in the in the shop before we go. I just come up and I hit delete all. It's going to get rid of the ones that I had loaded. I go to the track database, and uh, I just type in. You know, I I, I pre-did it here, but uh, the local little go kart track near me. It shows it. Grab it. Drop it drag and drop it down and that track has now been transmitted and if i go back to to here and go to tracks that now is the only track that's on there all of the track understanding what track we're running and and all of that has just been handled so very very handy and it and it, and it took us even me talking through it there took uh, less than 30 seconds so it's pretty pretty darn quick so okay matt sorry about that no problem that, that's a great example of how quick you can do this and get it ready um to be prepped for the event, or if you make the mistake, how you can do that in moments and again. Yeah. If, if, if all of a sudden you show up and the, they've choose the, of the 97 at button willow, they said, ah, oh, we're going to run 14 a this time. And, uh, well, okay, let me run back and, and just boom, boom, you just change them. It's re really pretty quick and easy. Yeah. And, um, a uh, great question here from Chad is, I don't remember the number right. Is it five thousand tracks in the database, Roger? Yeah, it's something a, like that. It's a it's a huge number. Let me. Uh, I am in, I am in uh, uh, beta, but if the numbers are close. Fifty five thirty two, and I think right. I've got two or three user ones. But it, but the, that that's a really accurate number. Yeah, and Chad asked, how long does it take for AIM to add one? If you have a data file and you share it, um, it gets added super fast. Because that data file gives them everything they need to put it in. Um, and that's really the best way. But we get those tracks. I say we. It's like the guys at AIM, Emiliano and his team, add them very, very quick. So it's a, a very easy way to add it if you have something that's not there. Um, and it's also one in different places. Like I saw initially Roger had Homestead. Sometimes you're on Homestead, it has the infield chicane. Sometimes it has the oval. Um if there's a new configuration or something, please share it so we can update that database. Yeah, and you the uh, there's an email address tracks at aimsportline.com. Uh, it will will take you right there. I even think there's even some ways inside the software to do it. Uh, if Chad uh, or anybody else, if if you find something, it is my personal little mission to uh, for North American tracks. And I've not only North American tracks, I've helped people all over the world. Somebody will have a track that they. Uh, uh, they're trying to get in the database. I have them send me the XRK. I do a little bit of the work for Emiliano and the, and the tracks team and uh, and send it to them and, and we can shortcut that even more. So if you have anything, tracks at aimsportline.com, send a data file uh, and uh, and or uh, CC me and I can help make that happen. I'm It's important to me to get as many good tracks as we can in the database. And Paul asked a really good question as a follow-up. As he said, if you want to analyze prior events, do you need to add it? add the track back on. So what we're talking about here is just on your dash in the gauge itself that is where we're loading the track for while you're driving. Real when time, you want to go back and analyze time. your data, that's always in Race Studio 3. It has everything in there. Every this is this is only for in the car while you're on track. So you get that live timing, you get the overlay. Um, if you have the predictive reference lab, it's going to do all those things for you versus the full analysis later on in Race Studio 3 or Race Studio 2 that um, those have the tracks in them. Good point, good point. So really good question, Paul. And an easy, uh, it's, it's an area sometimes people have trouble remembering that what happens in the dash for tracks is separate from what happens in the computer. And one last thing as we as we close up the track thing, some people are chatting about it. The uh, the, the the SCCA runoffs uh, right now at VIR, uh, they are running an alternate start finish line for the first half of the week for all of practice qualifying. Uh, and they're using the start finish line down at the south end of the track to make it quicker to clear the track. You get your 
you finish your qualifying lap, you come right to pit in and you get off the track, makes it faster for the racer, makes it faster for the overall situation. But then for the championship races, they're going to jump over and use the normal VIR full, the start finish line on the north end of the track for all official live timing, uh, all official timing. Uh, we have a document, I believe Emiliano's already linked it uh, in, in the chat. He may do it again. And also down, we'll have it in the description for those of you that are watching later. But there, uh, I created a document that talks about exactly how to walk through you as a user that's at VIR or any other place, uh, how to change those, not only in the logger, but in the software later, walks through all the different things for current equipment, as well as older uh, MXL pieces and things like that. So uh, Emiliano has those uh, that stuck up on the into the chat box. So keep that in mind. Uh, that's a that, that document has a ton of information in it, not just specifically about the 2023 runoffs, but that's what it's kind of built around. But there's a lot of good information in there for, for many other things you might want to do. It's a terrific document that you should grab as a little bit of a preface to everything you do when you go to the track and analysis. Like it, it's a really great document. I, I advise you no matter where you go, even if you're never going to VIR, exactly. grab it because it gives you a great overview of things to do. Step-by-step step for almost every process around the, the track issue uh, in but not only in the hardware but also in the software later so okay and the, the table of contents and everything in it are all hyperlinks so if you <laughs> see something you want you can click it it'll jump right to it um it's a terrific way for you to kind of have a little bit of a directory of things to do um, perfect okay so now we've moved on we've got track maps kind of taken care of now we've got um you're, you're doing kind of your final checks as you're getting ready to go matt what are you what are you showing here yeah so here i've got the the computer plugged into the dash or the solo 2DL and connected Wi-Fi. Um, computers on top of the car. Now I get in there and I make sure everything's working how I want. So I go through this master area and I make sure that um, we've got external voltage to it, that it's the system has good power, that um, any of the other sensors we have are good. I can see, you know, in this example, the GPS is working, um, that I've got a good positional accuracy. I can go in there and mark that up for you. So that's this one right here. We can see this one's sitting at my office yeah. and it's got a four and a half foot accuracy. I've got 10 satellites. Um, it's a good way to make sure that's all working. Things are and working. sort of the most important part of it is when we look over here, the GPS is good. So we don't have to try to interpret any of these numbers right away. We can just see it says it's good. Um, a very nice way to see all of that. And then um, the next part of that one is we can jump down here to the, here it says ACC. So what I did is I took a Solo 2DL, I connected the new ACC, you can do it with a channel expansion too. Um, and I can see that it's reading my throttle position, it's reading my steering sensor. Um, if you have an LCU one, it's going to end up there. If you have a TC hub, if you're if you've got an ECU, if you have uh, things connected on CAN two, this list is going to keep going. It's going to be broken down in different ways for you, and you can just see that everything's working. Um, it's a great way to do that final check. Make sure all your sensors are in. Make sure that they're reading. Um, it's one Roger. Uh, I drive him nuts with it. That my it's the next part we're going to go to. My steering sensor is not usually calibrated. <laughs> so you'll be in here and you have the steering wheel straight. And if this was hooked up to the car and the steering wheel was actually straight and it said minus 172 degrees, we know that thing is not calibrated right. Um, so it's a good opportunity to go in there and check it out. I just moved over to a live MXM that I have set. Uh, set up here off the side with has a steering position sensor uh that there this is always the last thing i do when before i shut off the car and get ready to put it in the trailer or you know, or whatever uh, another little trick you can do that i'm showing here is you can click on the name of the channel and it puts it over here in a bigger window that allows you to then uh, have it sit over on the workbench and you're sitting in the car and you can you can uh let, let's do throttle as well so Sometimes I, you know, I can't find, there it is. Uh, let's put throttle up there and steering. And I, I can maneuver, there's the throttle at 100% and I can bring it back down. So you can check all of your sensors. I love to have the them 
selected here so I can see it even bigger over here to make it easier for me to find. But um, this is always the the last thing I do before I uh, to know for a hundred percent sure everything is everything is working. And the what I, Roger just showed you with being able to click on it, have it highlighted on the the side is such a big deal to me because so often is I'll connect to the car, I put my laptop up on the roof, I turn it to me, I can go to the other end of the car and start moving the throttle body. I can move a shock sensor. I can do all those things far from the computer and still be able to look up and see it. Um, I use that feature all the time when I'm when I'm setting a car up, when I'm doing things to to check a calibration or make sure everything's okay. Live measures a very very strong a very strong tool and and yes. where and where the I'm going to jump out and go back to your presentation, but uh, we'll come back to this in just a moment. I think with uh, with uh, if I can find it, there it is. While we're here, actually, Roger, if you can go back there, something okay. we didn't talk about, but I just thought of, if you can click on the firmware tab, one of the other ones I'll look at is this firmware tab. If you have this one, we can see we have the MXM and we have a GPS 09 with it. If you have a shift light module, if you have the LCU1, a channel expansion, the ACC, you'll see all those firmware show up here. So you know everything's connected and working well. Um, if you have a problem, this is one of the first spots to go to to check to see does the system see it. And very quickly it'll tell you is there something not configured right because it sees it or it doesn't see it. So if the GPS wasn't working and we didn't have a good GPS signal and it didn't show up in this list, now we know for some reason it's not being seen as the cable damage. Did we do some work? We forgot to plug it in, right? It gives us something to start looking at to troubleshoot um, versus just being panicked that it didn't work. So another really easy spot to kind of jump into to see what's going on with the system and make sure everything works right. Um, a pretty powerful spot to see what you have and, and how it's all going. I like this area myself. And this is where you update your firmware from. If you notice yeah. that the number is not right, you'll have a you'll have a symbol over here that says something needs to be updated. Click on it and you're you're off and running. So yeah. So back to the live measures. Perfect. Uh, this is where you calibrate everything from. Emiliano has put a links into uh, some documents that I put together on creating and calibrating the, the three main sensor main analog sensors that you might want to do uh, if it even if it's something outside of that those the steps are very clear that you once you read those three you'll understand how the process works there's a steering sensor throttle sensor and suspension sensor uh, there's a document uh, that Emiliano has linked and of course they'll be in the vehicle uh, in the uh, video description after we get done uh, those documents are pretty handy if you don't do them very often it sure is nice to be able to have a nice little walk through with some suggested uh, 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 sample rates and things like that that are built into those okay Matt should we jump back to the presentation I think so okay there we go that's the screen we were at okay. yeah so let's jump to the next one the sensor calibration we were just talking about it right um, so these ones, when you look at it, I always kind of think of things as um, um, some sensors we ought to calibrate, some we want to know kind of the zero and the center, and some we want full and none or none and full. Um, so the zero calibration is something like a steering sensor, um, and some people will set shocks this way. So it's a great one. Um, you go in and you set the full left and right. One of the tricks that I always use, because this is most commonly on a steering wheel, is use something that's 90 degrees or 180 or 360 um, because with the design of your steering wheel and the arms in it you can see that those are level and then they're 90 degrees or 180 versus if you try to pick 45 you might be like me and you're a bad judge and it could be <laughs> five or ten degrees off exactly um, so i can flip it over and see that it's it's still horizontal and i know what i got 180 um, degrees completely upside down to completely upside down it's pretty uh pretty uh yeah pretty pretty air free right and you just type in whatever you're going to actually do here into yes. the bottom and and do yep. it it's easy and then um you know you click the point a the coin point b save and you're done um it's also great if you have a rotary sensor like one of these and it actually goes the wrong way on you you can reverse the points in here to get your calibration right um 
don't feel bad if this was something you set up and you never really looked at or you never checked. It's a great chance to get in there and do it now. Um, one of the ones, as Raj and I were talking, that's a good point to bring up is steering wheel versus the spindle angle. A lot of the engineering things you want to do in the extra math channels go off the spindle angle, what the tires are actually turned versus the wheel. Um, I like to calibrate them to steering wheel angle because as a driver, I always think I've got a gas pedal, a brake pedal, and a steering wheel. So if you tell me the steering wheels turn 32 degrees, I can't relate to that to anything. But if you told me you turn the steering wheel 90 degrees, I know where that is. Um, and that also, when we look at the video, it helps you, you know, you can imagine what was going on with that as you did it. The bulk is that how you like the, to do them, Roger? Yeah, the bulk of our users are using data as a driver training aid mm -hmm. and they they really want to know what their hands were doing uh, uh we do have obviously engineers that are using the, the the data to engineer the car as well they really want to know what the spindles are do do it as you wish it's uh, either one will work all you got to do is plug in the the values of hey i'm going to go 10 to 10 and because i'm doing spindles and you got it on turn plates or plug in, uh, you know, 180 to 180, and we're going to do the steering wheel. The the software doesn't care, right? All it does is it's, it's interpolating across these values. And Matt's mention here does not have to be full scale. That's also some a question I get a lot. If you tell it I've only gone to 180, and what happens if I turn 220 degrees in this in this hairpin, it's okay. It just ex, it, it interpolates out beyond the, the data point that you yeah. created. So it's all good. And Emiliano makes a good point is you can do whatever you want and use the math channels and analysis to go the other way. Exactly. Um, a, a great way. And Mitch has an even better idea for someone like me that can't <laughs> see level and straight is if you tape your phone to it, you can then use one of the angle finder apps and get it really accurate. Um, that's you know, for, us, that's data, pretty good that's for us data guys that, uh, that uh, that one degree matters too, right? Uh, right. You know, those, you know, a lot of people would say yeah, it's close enough. No, 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 no. Let's just do, do this just right, right? <laughs> exactly. Well, now I can offset mine to thirty point five. Exactly. On exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What's our um, next? Uh, what's our next? The next slide? one is your. Oh, I was gonna say the next one is because it's a little bit of a different when you set it up. Is the zero and hundred percent sensors something like a throttle position, um, where you have it closed and fully open? This one's a good one for making sure so many times as you get in there and you'll change things. If you're playing with your pedals, you're playing, you know, you had the intake off or something, you put it back on. This gives you a chance to see, is it still getting a hundred percent? It's kind of one of those extra little mechanical checks. Did something change? Is it fully opening? Um, so I, I always like to have that one set pretty well. Um, in in the chat, because, Aaron mentions. I'm sorry, I, I think I talked over you, but in, in the chat, yeah. Aaron mentions it's very important for motorcycle riders to have that. Uh, the numbers they're working with are much smaller. So I, I, we we have a lot of motorcycle racers that use our stuff, and that is very very true. So it, we we think in rough numbers as far as steering wheels that you know 180. You know, if you're off yeah. a few degrees, not the end of the world. But but on the bike, when you're when that little bit of what you're doing is is a is a is a big deal. Yeah, and that make, makes sense. Thanks thanks, Aaron. I love Ed's comment under it that um, he says it's close enough, which actually a long time ago at another job, my boss's boat was close enough, but it was ENUF. Um, <laughs> so it is, it's, it's interesting to see the two different things there because um, in analysis, like if we're looking at throttle position, I don't actually care what the numbers are. I want to see the shape and that when it was supposed to be full, it was full and it went back, you know, on those things versus whether it reads a hundred or 500, it doesn't really matter. 88 um, right, or you know, right. But it gives you the, where those details are that, you know, for someone like Aaron or Chloe on the motorcycles, yeah. that it's yeah. really critical because those, those turns are so much smaller. Yeah. Um, yeah. So a good chance to really hone your system into what's important for you. For you. Yep. There you go. There you go. And um, how, how do we calibrate these things? There's a whole process, right? Uh, yeah. Very, very, very um, easy, very fast, but there is a process. This is one that lots and lots of people forget. Um, and in a way it matters, in a way it doesn't. So the auto calibration part is to set your accelerometer. So if you gauge your Sola 2DL, if you take it out of the car and you mount it again, 
as its orientation to the car changes just a little bit, it changes how those accelerometers read and you need to recalibrate it. Um, so it's an important thing to set up. The flip side is so often anymore, we use GPS and never actually use those numbers um, yeah. because the GPSs are so good anymore that you don't need it. So the, uh, Rod is showing where, where you can yeah, go in and do yeah, where, where you get to that, there's a couple of icons here from the live mm -hmm. measures tab while you're connected. Make sure your car is level. And then, and then uh, one of these is for setting up when you actually have to calibrate them to run through a manual configure calibration process. And one of them is the auto, auto, auto calibration. If you click on that one, all of the sensors that are attached to your gauge that have a auto calibrate button you can just do them you can do them one at a time by clicking on hovering over here and and, and re-zeroing them out you'll see this number's changing uh, or just hit auto calibrate all make sure the car is at right height right and uh and uh if, if your suspensions are set up that way and auto calibrate all of these just all got zeroed out exit you're ready to uh to go on to the to the ones that have a process that matt already showed and uh, let's you know let's do the throttle one real quickly. We'll do this one just for fun. Uh, hundred to, uh, zero to a hundred. If it's reversed, we reverse it. But um, so we're setting right now with the carburetor or the fuel injection is closed. The throttle body is closed. So zero. We're going to set point A. It's set, it's set that way right now. At zero throttle. So we just hit set point A. It's picking up what the millivolts are and attaching the zero value to it. Then you get in the car, you push the throttle to full throttle, sit there and let it kind of balance out for a, you know about a second and hit set point B. And now you can sit here and practice with it before you even save it, run it up a couple times, go to halfway, you know, with your foot, whatever. And then, okay, I kind of like it. Let's save it. Boom you have now recalibrated i mean it's that it's that easy i've now recalibrated my uh my throttle position sensor pretty darn easy and the same the same basically the same thing in your steering i've got this one turned i think the um uh, yeah the other thing i kind of like to do especially with these 10 turn rotary pots is is they're zero to five thousand volts right so if you're going to put the little millivolts so if you're going to put it on there find the uh the 2500 or so so you know you're about in the middle of the sensor that's what the millivolts is there for and now it's asking for turn turn it a half you know, half a put 90 in there put 180 put uh, your angle finder on your phone whatever it is that you the numbers you're going to go left to right on to to do it uh so i'm going to turn mine the 180 to the left and i'm going to and you've seen it change i'm going to set point a left negative is always left turns left left values in in aim and then i'm going to rotate that around 180 degrees to the right i'm going to set point b and now i could sit there and, and come back up to near straight and you kind of watching the value here of what the what the sensor is if i'm happy with it uh, save it and now my steering right here is is active and it's correct you could test it a couple times in your shop before you go and now you know when you show up at the track you are uh, you're, you're ready to go there you go matt what uh you have anything to add to to that process no that was perfect that's that's what i run through with anything that needs to be calibrated before the event it is those two buttons right there in the live measures tab all all of that is also in those documents that uh, emiliano linked uh, ready for you to, to to walk through those same exact steps uh, in a in a document in case you don't have access to this video or you don't remember it okay. and it's one if you forgot to do that we can fix it in the channel settings later um so it's not something to panic about or think your data is junk for any reason we can fix the offsets we can fix the scaling we can go through and get those numbers to read pretty good for you later um, if that's something we need to do, and we're always happy to help you with that kind of stuff. Exactly. Okay. Um, Your next step, Matt. Another one that happens more often than it kind of surprised me sometimes is we can set up all the different pages in our displays um, for how we want to look at the data on our dash. Make sure you have those set up how you want and remember how to go through them. There's been a number of times that I've seen people on grid, I get called over and they go, it looks different. 
the dash is different. I need, you know, my predictive time. I need my bias, whatever it is. And somebody's really excited about it and they just forget they have to reach up there and click the view buttons and and go through it. So if you have a warm up screen and you have a mechanic screen and you have a qualifying or a race or whatever those different screens you like are, just remember how to go through them. Maybe practice it before you get to the track so that when you're on grid and you're stressed about it, you don't forget what to do get the right screen that you want there is even some ways if you want to get fancy uh, ahead of the event you can set up certain screens make a make a paddock screen that automatically turns itself on when you are your rpm is below you know 1000 rpm and your speed is below five miles per hour you can make an assumption that you're in the uh, in the paddock right so it can actually bring up and change to that page uh, automatically for you so there's uh, there's some uh, most people don't go to that level but if you wanted to you can but make sure like 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 matt talks about there's a predictive page he's got a plus minus for people that like to see those in the two different ways there's a startup one for when you first start up the car there's a troubleshooting one a lot of people do a qualifying mode where they have a lot of lap time information on it and then they have a race mode where they have a lot of information about all the mechanicals of the car because you're not really racing you know lap times typically at that point you're racing to get as fast as you can from point to a to b right the end from green to checkered and uh, we're qualifying you're really focusing on on those lap times so that uh, just some different ways of doing it but make sure you know what page you're on and and uh, be and know how to swap them around perfect man okay let's jump to the next one and then this one is um make sure you have your camera configured with the overlay you items you want so this is one everyone kind of has a personal preference how they do it and we've done a couple webinars on good overlays and bad overlays um or i shouldn't even say bad overlays i should say different ways to do it and and what's important to you so to me um what is important is I always put the date and time because when I go back and look at the video, I want to know what day it was. I can figure out the event and then I know the time so I can see a session. Um, driver name and class. If you need to turn your video into stewards, if you want to share it later, you want to know who was driving, who it was. Um, a lot of classes now have a requirement. It's either on your video or on the dash or the window or whatever. So it's really easy just to add it in a text field. Um, I like to have the lap number and the lap time on there. So when I go through, I can look and find it the same thing for your best lap and the best lap time. So you can quickly scroll through, find that best time. If you're just looking at video, um, to me as a driver, I want throttle position, brake pressure, RPM, G forces, speed. And if I have steering, I always have a steering sensor on there. So I, I can see that part too. Um, in Smarty Cam 3 devices, it's really easy now to put on that predictive time. I love to have that because as I'm reviewing my video, I can see, hey, I was up on the lap and then I had this bobble. It, it kind of cost me this much. And then if you have sponsors, you can put those sponsors logos on there and those kind of things. Um, the flip side of all this is this is what's important to me. This is what I like to have. But with the synced data and video, you could have nothing on there. You can bring your video into Race Studio 3 with your data and you have everything on it. So it's a great opportunity to, you could have everything, you could have nothing, and it really depends where you want to go. Um, yeah, very, so pers neat, very personalized, um, right? So some people some people like a lot. Some people like it be very minimalized and, and use the data piece for it. To, what's cool about it is is you get to do what you want. That's what's the mm -hmm. That's the best part of it. And th this ties in a little bit to Kyle's question about, um, or I, how I'm interpreting his question. Hopefully I have it right. But he's asking about being able to display onboard timing and being able to share that. So I believe what he's asking about is, is there a way to get this information out of the car? And with the Smarty Cam 3 GPs and the Dual, we have the ability to have that video output and stream that um, to YouTube, to Facebook, to Twitch, to all these different areas to put it out there. And one of the neat things when you do that is the real-time addition of the lap times of your engine temperatures, your throttle position, your lap times, all those things, they're on the video real-time. So somebody in the pits can then watch that video and know everything. Um, in the off-road world, 
I've actually had a number of people do it where they put all their temperatures and everything so the driver doesn't pay any attention and somebody in the chase vehicle is watching the stream on their iPad or their phone and they're monitoring the car so the driver just focuses. Um, I've seen a couple of videos at night in the dust. I'm not sure what the driver focuses on because you can't see much, but they're really focused forward and trying to drive and somebody else kind of monitors that car. Interesting, um, right? Interesting. Yeah. So a neat way that you can then use these overlay items and get way more information on there. Um, and we talk about audio lately. We've has been a, a chat of a lot of people. What do you think about adding uh, and how do we add some audio into it other than just the noise of the engine and the, and the wind going by? Yeah. Um, so Kyle gave a follow up to his question and said, what about information coming from the race organizers? Um, that really depends on the, the other systems that we want to tie into. One of the ones that we do right now is through the flagging systems. So we can take the can output of the flagging system, bring that into the dash, and then you could have alarms and everything else. And then you can also put that um, flag code onto the video real time so you have it in the video. So if you got accused of passing under yellow, you could show, hey, this thing still said green. Um, or you got passed, right? And you can say it was under yellow and here's the yellow flag and there's the guy going by. So you can do all those things with it. Um, and on the video side, Chloe asked if there's plans to add more channels to the overlay options. So I think uh, sort of a twofold question there is with the Smarty Cam 3s, we have the standard, I think it's 17 channels now that we get to add um, that are in the regular protocol, but you can do a, an advanced protocol and put anything in there that you want. And you can have all these different options of um, channels that you put out. So anything the dash collects, you can put on there. So my example, um, we've talked in the webinars about having heart rate or driver temperature and all those things. You can put those on there. Um, and then the overlay icons, they're kind of always adding to it. That's something that AIM is really good about and, and brings about. So recently they added the flag codes, they added the steering wheel sensor, they added the lean icon for a motorcycle, how far it's leaning. And then there's gonna be more and more of those over time as they keep getting added. Um, so it's really the combination of in the advanced stream and then use those, uh, the different bar graphs and the different number readouts that we have. Um, and you can look at it that way. And it, and then it kind of depends on how you want to work on it. Um, and so, and, and the other thing that we, we have done in the past and we have cables that are available for it is, is adding the two-way radio uh, in there, whether or not it's uh, you're, you're a driver coach and you ride with people of the intercom system or the two-way radio talking to your, to your, uh, uh, to your spotter or um, you know the pit crew or whatever that can also be added into your video and then that adds a whole nother dimension of when you watch the video back and you're watching you know playing it in your data the uh you you can hear when you said something when something was said to you that kind of a thing very powerful yeah and russ just commented that he did a setup um just last week that he got the mic cable for his smarty cam he added uh like a lapel mic in his helmet and then he was able to narrate his video as he drove and get all that he said it worked great i have it set up that um my son wanted and my daughter wanted to be my spotters so we put a radio system in and um aim shared it on theirs and i have it on my instagram feed as well um a great video of my son after i messed up a corner a couple of times telling me i should really work on it so it's a great way to put those things in there um and to be able to go back and really analyze everything uh, we used to do that in in uh, w w when we had that going into our video system as well. And uh, when my son was racing, and uh, we were racing at a high level, and you know, and you know, stresses are high sometimes. And you know, father son talking on the radio. There was some video we couldn't necessarily share after a uh, after <laughs> after bickering on the cool down lap, right? But but uh, one of the things that he did because of just memory and and fresh on your mind. Uh, by him clicking the button and talking out onto the radio, we just had a scanner that was bringing it into the into the video. Um, he would walk his way around the course, and when he'd go through, okay, going into turn three here, this is where I was having the trouble, and it was understeering in, or you know, right here is where it would snap loose, or you know, something like that. And 
uh, when you whether or not all you you miss some of those things in the in the post race debriefing sometimes right you're busy you got a hundred other things going on and having it in the video was 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 very helpful to us to, to for during his cool down lap maybe even during the event but but mainly on the cool down lap he would just push the button and talk his way around the entire course before he even come into pit in and give uh, feedback on what the car was doing so that was very handy to us and th that's super powerful because you know. I don't see anyone on here that's an IndyCar driver, an IMSA driver. Um, for the rest of us that are mortals trying to do exactly. this stuff, it's hard to remember when you come in to get out of the car, you have to fill the car, you got to check the oil, you got to do all these other things. What was happening on track escapes you so quick. So to be able to put those comments and those things into the video um, gives you such a great chance to offload that information while it's happening and then go back and review that cool down lap to see all the different things. Um, exactly. Okay, let's jump to the next screen, which is which is a little bit about what you just said. You know, we've been walking through these very filled screens with all sorts of cool little tips and everything, and then and then Matt built this slide, and I thought it was kind of funny. And uh, you know, use your data, right? It, when it's all said and done, we've just created this thing and we built, we've added all the track maps. We've built this thing where it's really working cool. Review it, right? It so often somebody collects this video, they collect the data and then it's a week later and they go, Hey, I wanted to review that data in the moment is when you need to do it. So you hop out of the car, you get everything done. Um, review that data before you go back out on track. If you have the comments on your smarty cam, if, it's something as little as you say, um, I want to be better with not coasting. Go look at your data. Look at your video. Did I go from the gas right to the brakes? Did I eliminate that coasting? Did I turn my hands better? Whatever those things you're trying to work on, um, look at them. Maybe it's as simple as it's a new track for you and you really want to do well. And you're reviewing car position. Did I use the whole track? Did I hit the apex? Um Get in there, use the data, use the video, because if you're not reviewing it before you go back out, it's too late. There, There is value. A couple little tools we just talked about by putting some video uh, audio into your video. Maybe that does add some value to look at it a, a week later. The, we all want to look at our data right away. It's it's important. But let's say something has happened. You're a one man band and you and you you just can't get to it sometimes. Right. Those things happen obviously the best thing to do is to, to do it but if you don't let we've also talked about some tools to make it where the data is a little bit uh, a little bit more useful later a, a week later right so uh, but the best thing to do is while it's fresh in your mind download it uh, on top of the whole there was some oil pressure uh, losses or your your alternator went out and you didn't notice the light and now you're you're seeing you know 11.9 volts or something the, using the data is you know, for, for vehicle health is, is such an important part as well. Okay. Let's, and wait, the, wait, 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 go ahead. I put this one in. The last one is no, there's help out there for you that um, aim. I'm going to steal Roger's line. They're a customer support company that happens to sell dashes and cameras and gauges. Um, but so often at the big events, there's an aim person there. So this week, if we're talking about the runoffs, um, Corey and Jacob are there. They've got the AIM Sprinter van. They've got the tent. They've got the Grom that they're running around the paddock on. Um, if you see one of those guys, throw them a water bottle because they're out there working their tails off the whole time. Yeah. And then ask them for questions. They've got spare parts with them. If you have a sensor that's not working, bring them in. They're going to help you out with um, whatever it is to take to fix it. If you have a system that's not working, They'll get in there and dig into it with you and try to help you get it working. Um, if you have questions about it, they'll get in there and help you with it. Um, if you can't find them at the track, call the 800 number. One of the coolest things about AIM is they have an East Coast and a West Coast office. So from 8 in the morning Eastern time to 8 p.m. Eastern time. So for that full 12 hours, you can get people. Um, if you're on the West Coast and you're starting early at heck 5 a.m you can get one of the people and you can get them all the way after and then my contact info is on one of the other um slides is As we shoot me an email give me a call shoot me a text whatever it is uh, i'll help you too um even on the weekends when somebody calls in i get a text message that there was a message and if it's something i can help you out with, i'm going to get back to you as fast as i can to try to keep you running um 
because the aim guys are just like me that uh all of us we sell products that you're using on nights and weekends and everything else so we're here to help you as much as we can absolutely the um they're doing the best we can to make software and, and hardware that's easy to use and it doesn't need a ton of help but it's something you don't do all that often we get that and uh, when you do need help it's uh, you need the help so we've built a process uh, aim has built a process around making sure you get the the support you can get those the folks you the answer the phone at the 800 number are uh, you, you're talking to people that understand what they're doing and if they don't understand it fully right there somebody sitting right next to them does and uh so you we can get you the help pretty quickly so okay let's let's kind of close it up now we're, we're about there the um i appreciate all of that matt that was a lot of information uh, i knew we would be struggling a little bit to get it all in 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 time but it's uh uh i i seen a couple of other notes there that were Boy, Roger, this would be great in the spring. You know, maybe a, a review of this, maybe a slightly different flavor to it. And maybe we do that uh, as as the season starts up uh, after the after the winter time break. So, the um, uh, this video, just like all the rest of them, will go up onto our Aim uh, Learn Fast YouTube site. Uh, if you go onto YouTube and just type in Aim Data, you'll find us. Uh, this will be the next of uh, 129 videos that we have there, uh, always growing. Uh, so go ahead and visit that. You can see all of our webinars, uh, plus tons of shorter ones. And we've got some plans to be uh, snipping apart some of these um, uh, webinars and put smaller pieces in there and, uh, and make these things a little easier to find. So I have spent a lot of time over the last year or so going back, changing the keywords in, in areas. So if you use the search bar in the YouTube uh, on the YouTube page, on our YouTube page, uh, if you just type in sensor calibration, it's going to bring up the videos that have uh, information about that. So I've, I've worked hard on making sure that that search bar will find what you need. So try that. Uh, I know that a lot of these are an hour long and it's kind of hard to find the piece you're after, but it's uh, that will help you a lot. So go visit that. Uh, all of these will be up there, including this one within uh, within a couple of hours. We'll have this one up there and ready for you to go uh, uh, review if you wanted to check something out or if those uh, those that watch later, you can find all of our different videos there. Matt mentioned and uh, used that uh, picture of that. That's a picture of me, I think, four or five years ago. I think that was me. That, but uh, the, <laughs> no, um, uh, we, we do mention that a lot. But, uh, you know, we're really a, a support company that happens to sell racing electronics. And and that's just the, the way that the, that's the mind structure that we that we think about, uh, because that's the best for the customer. And um, so we're ready to go. Give us a holler, um, drop emails to us, give us a call. A, a call. Uh, if you need some help, we're, we're there to help you and make sure we get this uh get you up and running as fast as possible we have uh folks like matt and chloe here who's on the uh, uh in the chat watching here today as well that are often out at the racetracks and answering questions for folks as well so we have a, a pretty strong uh team and, and might i even say uh, all very very good people to help you as much as uh, any help you need next webinar october 31st um We'll try to do that in the morning. Uh, obviously, it's Halloween, but uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we're, we're going to do one that day. Uh, my guess is we'll have it with uh, Emiliano here, and we'll be talking about a new function or two that we've uh, added uh, uh, just recently. So come join us uh, October 31st, Tuesday, always the last Tuesday of every month at, uh, at the same time that we've uh, started these, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern live, and of course, uh, putting them onto the YouTube site right afterwards. So come join us a, a month from now, and we'll do another one hollow rs r rs3 there you go uh contact information matt mentioned this just a little bit ago uh, matt's information uh, trailbreak.com is his is his website uh email address matt at trailbreak.com pretty easy to remember uh even i can remember that i uh I, I i don't have to look him up i can type that in and um uh, and my contact information there on the left as well um, please drop us a note if you have any questions about this if you have uh, you know, when it comes to the webinars itself or other training materials uh, drop me a note let me know what you think uh, is, is something that uh, that maybe we haven't focused on enough or maybe it's something that's old and it needs a refresh and another video on or a, a short video drop me a note let me know i'm always looking forward to those as well so perfect let's um uh let's let's call this one a day but um the, uh, oops, I knew I was going to do that. Um, Matt, is there anything else you'd kind of like to add as we're kind of closing this one down? 
The last real quick thing, because we had a lot of international folks with us today and we're sort of U.S. centric. You can always reach out to us. We're going to help you. There's also a great list on the AIM Sportline website with all the different countries um, and the link right to Italy that you can email in and get help too. So even if you're not in the U.S., if English isn't your first language, um, don't worry. Reach out. We'll find a way to help you out. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Matt. Thanks for everybody that came here, uh, joined us today. Some of those that are uh, hanging out at VIR. I hope the weather has all turned better. It sounds like it has so far, but uh, I hope it stays nice the rest of the week for everybody there. That's a big, important race, and we want uh, everybody to, to have as much fun as they can. So thanks, everybody, for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Talk to you soon.